Okay, so welcome to this next video on the store operated calcium entry. Okay, so we've seen how uh, by stimulating our cell with histamine, uh, we can activate the, the uh, production of IP3. And at the moment, we're considering a local stimulation of the cell with histamine. So we haven't doused the entire cell in histamine. We're considering, you know, maybe a neuron has stimulated our cell, and it's got a specific point that it has released histamine onto. So you've got a local rise in IP3, basically. Okay, right, uh, rather than a whole cell rise, okay, so uh, if I doused the whole cell in histamine, the whole cell would have had a rise in IP3, and that causes a very different kind of uh, calcium signaling than what we're going to see, basically, and if you want to learn more about that, uh, look at my uh, videos on uh, calcium waves. Okay, right, uh, so uh, we've seen how before IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor, it has available this inhibitory calcium binding site. Now, the, each of these subunits of the IP3 receptor also has an IP3 binding site, which I'll denote in pink. So in pink, this is the IP3 binding site. So this here is the IP3 binding site. So when uh, IP3 goes up in the vicinity of these IP3 receptors, what happens is that an IP3 molecule is going to bind to each one of uh, these four subunits. So an IP3 molecule is going to bind here, an IP3 molecule is going to bind here, an IP3 molecule is there, etc. So four IP3 molecules are going to bind overall to the IP3 receptor because you have four subunits. Okay, now when IP3 binds to the IP3 binding site, what it does is it changes the conformation of that IP3 receptor subunit so that this inhibitory calcium binding site is uh, removed, basically. It's no longer exposed to the uh, cytoplasmic side of the... Um, it's no longer exposed, basically, to the cytoplasm. And instead, what becomes available is a, a stimulatory calcium binding site. So let me draw that here. Okay, so here's another picture of the IP3 receptor. And it again, it still has four separate subunits here. And basically, once IP3 has bound to these four IP3 binding sites here, what it results in is um, in the um, IP inhibitory calcium binding sites being retracted, basically, and instead, a stimulatory calcium binding site is made available. So this is in green now. So here's our stimulatory calcium binding site. Okay, so here's our stimulatory calcium binding site. Right, so now what can happen is if calcium uh, binds to those stimulatory calcium binding sites, then the IP3 receptor will open. Okay, so it's a common misunderstanding or common misconception among medical students that IP3, it's an innocent mistake that IP3 actually opens the IP3 receptor. Instead, it is fought to um, prime the IP3 receptor, ready uh, to open it. It puts it into a state where calcium can actually trigger it to be opened. But it's calcium that actually opens the receptor, not IP3. IP3 is fought to change uh, the confirmation of the IP3 receptor so that calcium can now open it. Okay, so this is the stimulatory calcium binding site. Now, if four calciums happen to bind in those uh, calcium binding sites, then this IP3 receptor will now open. And although, even though the calcium concentration is low intracellularly, it's not zero, basically. Also, um, you have to remember that potentially uh, the uh, histamine will not be being given alone, uh, i.e. Um, the neuron that's synapsing onto the cell or whatever it is that's stimulating the cell may also provide other stimuli to the cell that may open potentially ligand-gated ion channels which could result in calcium influx from extracellular, um, extracellular fluid. Uh, what, whatever happens, um, these IP3 receptors start to open when the IP3 has primed them. Uh, and basically, it's because four calciums are binding to these stimulatory calcium binding sites. So the IP3 receptor starts to open. Now, if IP3 has opened in a... Um, sorry, if IP3 has um, gone up in a sort of large little volume of this cell, uh, 
then a whole neighborhood of IP3 receptors here will all have IP3 bounds. So let's say IP3, you know, has gone up in this bit of the cell here. Okay, so IP3 has gone up here. So all of the IP3 receptors in this region will all have four IP3 molecules bound to them. And they will all be in a prime state where if they just receive calcium, what will happen is they will open. Now, if one IP3 receptor it just so happens to open, maybe because it was lucky enough to get four calciums binding to it, uh, even though the calcium concentration is so low intracellularly, it was just happened that one of them was lucky enough to get four calciums binding to its stimulatory calcium binding sites. Then that one opens and releases a lot of calcium from the intracellular stores. These channels have an incredible um, capacity uh, for moving calcium, about a million ions per second. So they can move a lot of calcium out into the, um, into the cytoplasm. This calcium is going to flow over, spill over, onto these other IP3 receptors, which have got IP3 bound to them. So they are sitting in this state. All they need is calcium to bind to them, and then they will open, basically. So what this is going to trigger is all of these calcium um, all of these IP3 receptors to open and release calcium as well. So these are going to open as well. Now, uh, that means that calcium is going to go up in here. Now, is it going to go up over here? Well, let's have a look at these IP3 receptors on the edge of this region here. What's going to happen to these IP3 receptors? Well, these IP3 receptors were not so lucky. They did not get IP3 bound to them. So, because the IP3 only went up in this region, we're hypothesizing. You know, it's, it's a cartoon. Um, but let's suppose these two receptors on the edge here did, did not get IP3 bound to them, basically. So they are still sitting in this conformation. They have inhibitory calcium binding sites. So when the calcium spills over onto those, it's going to inhibit them. So you're only going to get the activation of the IP3 receptors in the region where IP3 has actually gone up. It's not going it's going to actually naturally inhibit even more the IP3 receptors around that region that don't have IP3 bound to them. Okay, right. So this sort of local rise in calcium that we're going to get here is what's known as a calcium puff, and it's a type of calcium signaling that can result. Uh, from activating the GQ pathway. And if you watch my videos on in this playlist on calcium signaling, uh, entitled, I think, the GQ pathway, we discuss the three different types of calcium signaling that can arise because of um, GQ activation. And they are calcium blips, calcium puffs, and then calcium waves. Okay, so we're supposing we've got a calcium puff here. Now, we're discussing store-operated calcium entry, or we're supposed to be anyway. So what happens now? You've got your calcium signal, and that will do whatever the calcium signal does. But how is this calcium returned back into the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, um, I can't really draw it on here because I've run out of space, but let me draw another endoplasmic reticulum here. So basically, this is supposed to represent that same endoplasmic reticulum. I've just sort of transplanted it over here uh, so that I can have another go at drawing things in there. So let's say these are those green lines that I've drawn there, basically. Now, there is another protein in the, in the ER membrane, basically, that's important in calcium signaling. And this protein is known as the circa pump, OK? And the circa pump stands for the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. And I'll write that here, actually. Sarco, um, sarco slash endoplasmic, let me pull this out a bit, endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. OK. Uh, so what is the function of the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, or the circa for short? Well, basically, what the circa does is it moves two calcium ions back into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen in exchange for moving free protons out. So free protons go into the cytoplasm in exchange for two calcium in, and also 
you have it's an ATPase. The name says it so. So it has to um, break down ATP to do this transformation, uh, and it breaks it down into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate. So it hydrolyzes ATP in order to move two calciums back into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen and free protons out of the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. So this pump is responsible for returning the calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum after uh, it's gone up, after, you know, after it's left the ER to go into um, the cytoplasm to cause this calcium puff. Okay, but it's not the only thing that, um, res that moves this calcium out of the cytoplasm, basically. There is also a um, pump in the membrane here, which is moving calcium ions out of the cytoplasm and into, um, into the extracellular fluid. So this is known as the plasma membrane associated calcium ATPA. So plasma, let me move this in here. Okay, so plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase. Associated calcium ATPase, or uh, PMCA for short. Calcium ATPase. And basically, this PMCA uh, channel, uh, well, pump, uh, moves a single calcium out of the cytoplasm of the cell. And to do that, what again, what it has to do is it has to hydrolyze ATP. So it takes in one adenosine triphosphate molecule and hydrolyzes it down to adenosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate molecule. So this PMCA pump is moving calcium out of the cytoplasm and into the extracellular fluid. And at the calcium concentrations we're dealing with, it's really the only thing that does that. There is another channel in, uh, well, another pump in the um, in the plasma membrane called the sodium uh, calcium exchanger. I'll draw it here. So this is the sodium calcium exchanger, which moves free sodium in uh, for a single calcium out. Sodium calcium exchanger. Um, and this is often abbreviated to NCX for sodium, calcium, and then exchanger, like so. And this moves one calcium out uh, for free sodiums in, okay? So it uses secondary active transport, whereas the PMCA and the CERCA both use uh, primary active transport. Um, but this only becomes um, relevant, basically, when calcium, uh, sorry, when calcium uh, level in the cytoplasm becomes dangerously high, and in this calcium puff, it's probably not going to become dangerously high. Uh, so, physiologically, the PMCA is far more important in removing this calcium from the cytoplasm after a calcium puff than uh, is the sodium calcium exchanger. Now, uh, the so plasma membrane associated calcium ATP is, is very slow, it works at around 150 calcium ions per second. Uh, but it is going to have an effect. It is going to mean that some of this calcium that was released from the endoplasmic reticulum um, is going to, instead of being returned back into the endoplasmic reticulum by circa, it's going to be chucked out of the cell. And that means that after the GQ pathway has finished, after everything's calmed down and finished, this ER lumen is going to have less calcium in it than when we began. And that is why we need store-operated calcium entry. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.